Hi, I'm Pam Fox, and I'm streaming live on YouTube into the Plantae Reflux Facebook group. Uh, if you're new to my channel, I do, I've been doing every Tuesday a live uh, cooking demonstration from my new cookbook, which is called Plantae Reflux. Show it to you. It's my cookbook, Plantae Reflux. Is, it's an ebook, and um, I just released it. A little over a month ago and it's a book that's uh, all plant-based rest all plant-based recipes for people with reflux that want to try a plant-based diet all of the recipes eliminate it eliminate the common trigger foods for reflux so no tomatoes no garlic and onions no spices no of course no meat dairy and eggs. it's a plant-based diet um, so in the book I have recipes and then I have I think 15 chapters me talking about reflux and about plant-based diets and how and how I've achieved my success. And today we're going to throw together a taco salad. And but we're also going to talk about let's see what chapter. Oops, what chapter are we in? I think we're in chapter 13, but I get it wrong every week, don't I? All right, so we are in chapter 13. I got it right this week. The title is a long title. It is, I've been successful on diets before, but never have I been able to stick to one long term. What's the secret? <laughs> so today I'm gonna to be going through chapter 13 and it's basically the five things that I found the most helpful when I transitioned to a plant-based diet um, that I think are really, really important in terms of um, of setting yourself up for success. And we've talked about some of the, these things already earlier uh, last month. Um, we're going to go through chapter 13. So let's, before we do that, let's go ahead and throw together the salad. So in the cookbook, I have my taco salad, but I also have my summer salad. They're similar dishes. The taco sa summer salad is closer to a raw Mexican dish or some, or a taco salad. This dish is um, a cooked taco salad. Hang on. So several of my recipes do call for these sweet baby bell, a trigger food for reflux, but these orange and yellow and sometimes red peppers um, are considered are considered safe for people with reflux. I should have, yeah, I'm gonna rinse these really quick. So I keep my peppers in the freezer, which is nice because they're always available. And when the bag gets low, I just pick up another bag. And they're really easy to chop. You just take them um, out of the freezer, put them in a little bit of water, and then they're perfect to chop up. Hang on, just a second. All right, so I'm just gonna chop up, see if you guys can see me today. So I hope everybody's doing well. Um, here where I live in my small town on the coast of Oregon, Southern Oregon, um, I wouldn't say we're not affected by the coronavirus. We've been, we've done really well. Um, we haven't had a lot of cases. We haven't had hardly any deaths. Um, so we've done really well. In the state of Oregon, we do have, you know, you can't go outside without wearing a mask unless you're able to social distance. You can't go into any shops without wearing a mask, period. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely living here. I'm aware of what's going on, but, you know, it's. I know that every place is different. Like, I've kept a really close eye on both Seattle, or yeah, Seattle. My daughter lives in Seattle, and uh, and my son did live in LA, so I was keeping a close eye on the the riots and the looting and all of that stuff in LA. Um, he and his girlfriend actually recently moved out. They lived in Burbank, which is just outside of LA, and they they moved they moved out. They moved north of there, so I was really happy that they did that. Um, I think they're in a much better place now just in terms of kind of being away from the chaos and, and that kind of thing. So 
But anyway, yeah, um, so far so good here where I live. Things are, things are pretty good. So I hope things are well wherever you are as well. I know that for most of the U.S., um, things really are getting better, which is good. And a lot of people don't want to talk about that because I think they're afraid that if people think things are going to get better, they're going to start getting lazy about washing your hands and distancing and wearing a mask and all that stuff. Um, so we're just going to have to wait and see how this all plays out. I know you guys know I love you in the pot, but um, this is just a quick saute. And I'm going to this whole thing of mushrooms, you can throw them in their hole, but I'm just going to give them um, kind of a quick chop so that they're kind of small. Almost like to, um, where's my bigger knife? Almost to um, kind of replicate ground, ground beef. So sometimes I chop this up really, really fine. That's good enough though. I'll give it a little bit more. That's good enough. So I'm going to put this into the pan. Those peppers are already caramelizing. I use um, non-stick. I use non-stick pans, which means I rarely ever cook with any oil. It's just not necessary because I use um, these non-stick pans and it's already starting to kind of, I don't know if you can see, but kind of uh, caramelize there in the pan. And if it starts to stick, I'll just add a few drops of water. So this is the, um, this is the taco salad in the cookbook, not the summer salad. So the summer salad is very similar ingredients, a little bit different. Um, but it's more of a raw salad. So it's, uh, that's why I call it summer salad, just because it's just more um, fresh and, and it's got more raw ingredients. So I just put in a can of corn and I have my handy dandy <laughs> shredded carrots. It's just shredded, but they're not really shredded. They're more like little matchsticks as opposed to like shreds. I'm gonna put a handful of those in there. So this is an example of, um, you know, carrots to replace tomatoes. Do carrots taste anything like tomatoes? No, of course not. But um, it just adds that color that you're used to a taco salad, that the tomatoes would give that color. Tomatoes also give it a little bit of juiciness, um, but the corn gives it a little bit of juiciness. So this calls for a can of beans. I just had some pinto beans. I just had some pinto beans in the pantry, so, but any beans would work. Use um, kid, uh, kidney beans, pinto beans, these are black beans, excuse me, these are black beans. Um, black eyed peas, light beans. You could use whatever beans you like. All right, so I am going to chop up a few olives for garnish, or not garnish, but just as an extra topping. And we're also going to top this with a little bit of avocado and some tortilla chips. Here's my avocado. This little avocado might have gone overboard. I really wanted to go to the store today because I was out of cilantro and leeks, which this recipe calls for. I was lazy though. I didn't feel like going. Questionable. <laughs> but edible. I will eat this. <laughs> I'm just going to kind of stick out the darker bruise parts. Give this a little stir. Give you guys a peek. Need to put our spices in here as well. I'm going to do that really quick. So this recipe calls for a tablespoon of sumac, which is the lemony Mediterranean spice that I use a lot in the cookbook. Um, 
you can't always find sumac like in a traditional I know in my local grocery store it's not always I, don't, I never see it um, so you might have to order it online if you want to experiment with sumac or and this calls for two teaspoons which is about a tablespoon of cumin um, but you can order sumac online it's a lemony Mediterranean spice I happen to be fortunate that we have a spice pantry like I live right downtown and there's a spice pantry downtown I can walk to it so um, so yeah try out sumac if you haven't tried it you know lemon is one of the um, trigger ingredients for for reflux so we eliminate it in my cookbook and in this challenge if anyone's new here for the first time we're doing the plant eye reflux challenge which is a 28 day I'm just kind of stirring that those spices in a 28 day plant-based challenge for people with reflux that eliminate it eliminates all common trigger foods for reflux just to see how you do like how you might respond or if, if your reflux goes away or or even some people they notice their health in general improves when they're on a plant-based diet that's been my story if you were here last week or the week before I shared my kind of my testimony um, of all the different <laughs> issues and problems that I uh, overcame on a plant-based diet it was really really something else so <laughs> this avocado again is on the brink <laughs> it's on the brink but I'll eat it and I'll be fine I'll eat it and I'd be, I'll be fine I just kind of scooped out some of the darker I had a feeling that was going to happen. I, I, I need to go to the store today to get more avocado, to get cilantro, to get leeks, some of the things I needed for this dish. And I just, I had a long day, and when it was time to go, I literally had my purse on my shoulder. I had my mask in my hand. I was just like, you know what? <laughs> I can make this dish without those things. It's okay. Okay, I am going to chop up. This recipe calls for some greens. I just have a handful of greens here. You could use spinach. You could use kale. You could use collards. Just another way to sneak some greens in. And we're going to be serving this on a bed of greens as well. So, greens and greens. Greens and greens. Serving this dish on a bed of greens and grains. That's what makes it, to me, taco salad. And then we'll top it with these toppings. Okay? So, I'm just going to let that cook for another minute. And then we'll plate that up. But let's talk about these five tips for success on a plant-based diet. Um, I need to go to chapter 13. That's chapter 14. Okay. Okay. So the first one is um, basically really, really simple, not rocket science, but <laughs> so, so important, is to love what you eat and eat what you love, right? I say it many times in the book, when it comes to succeeding on any diet, if you can feel like you're not on a diet, that's going to be success for you. Because as soon as you feel like you're on a diet and you have to restrict and leave things out and and you're hungry and all that kind of stuff, then you're setting yourself up for failure and it's gonna make it really hard. You're gonna to have to depend on willpower, right? <laughs> um, but if you never feel like you're on a diet, you will continue to succeed on that diet because you're not gonna feel like you're having to give things up, right? So you need to figure out what you love, get an arsenal of recipes that work for you and perhaps your family, um, and love what you eat and eat what you love. Right? Even if, it, even if you only have four or five recipes, like maybe a potato hash and a pizza or, or a pasta dish or a salad or whatever, or a soup, and just go through those, you know, just go through those things. And if you're the type of person that just really needs a lot of variety and you get sick of things, then yeah, you're going to have to really make some effort and experiment with some different dishes so that you can um, build that arsenal of those recipes. But... Um, it's not that hard. It just takes some time and effort when it comes to plant-based eating to develop, uh, um, you know, a, a few recipes that you know that you're going to look forward to, that you know that are going to be delicious, satisfying, and filling, 
that you know that you can throw together and that, you know, all of the ingredients are reasonable for you. They're easily, you know, you can find them at your local store or whatever. So you need to make it realistic and, and just figure it out, figure out what you love and stick to that. Eat what you love, love what you eat. It really is a simple idea, but it's, it means everything when it comes to success on a plant-based diet because a lot of people try plant-based diets and they can't stay on them because they feel like, oh, I really, really miss bacon or, oh, I really, really miss eggs. But if you're, if the foods that you're replacing bacon and eggs with, for example, you love just as much, they're real, again, really delicious and filling and, and realistic for you, then you're going to start that idea. It's really all in the head. It's going to start to fade away that you miss those things because you're eating things that you love just as much, right? And you have the benefit of starting to feel better, overcoming your reflex. Maybe, maybe you're trying to lose weight. Maybe you're trying to, you know, lower your blood pressure, overcome your diabetes and get off your medications or whatever. And so these other things start to happen. And that's really going to fuel your desire to want to stay on the plant-based diet, right? So eat what you love and love what you eat. Number two, don't let yourself get hungry. And we've already talked quite a, a bit about this um, earlier or last month, but um, what I was just saying about people trying a plant, I was just talking to a guy today when I was at work and he was saying that he was a vegan for several years. And one day he was just like, I can't do it anymore. I'm starving all the time. And he told me that he just, he's not compatible with the vegan diet. His every cell in his body was screaming for meat. And when he took that bite of meat, it was like, Oh, you know, he was just so happy. That may be true, but another theory would be that he was just hungry because he wasn't eating enough food, right? Um, some people, like this particular gentleman and like my husband, have a higher metabolism. And so you do have to eat more calories. And if, when you go on a plant-based diet, you can start to lose a lot of weight really quickly to the point where it might be a concern, right? Because you just, like, you're dangerously underweight. So I get it. I know that it's different for everybody, but... When it comes to not letting yourself get hungry, especially for people with reflux, it means you kind of have to be smart because like I know when I eat, I eat a really large volume of food because then I know I'm not going to have cravings later and I know I'm not going to want to snack later. I'm fine because I ate a huge meal. Um, so that's what I do. Now, I know for a lot of people with reflux, that's not, that's not possible, especially if you have a hiatal hernia. Those large meals can cause a lot of pressure on that lower esophageal sphincter. They can cause, if they cause bloating and things like this, then that's going to cause the symptoms to flare up. So, so you have to find that balance and what works for you of making sure you're meeting your caloric needs, meeting your nutrient needs, stretching those stretch receptors in your stomach, but still not, you know, activating your reflux by eating these huge meals. And so usually what that looks like is five or six smaller meals throughout the day. And so you might want to, you know, make a big meal and then pack up the leftovers in something you can stick in the refrigerator or take to work and then snack on it throughout the day. Maybe you have, you know, a couple of short breaks where you eat smaller meals throughout the day. And yeah, that's kind of a pain in the butt. I get it. But think of this as, a, as giving yourself time to heal. And this might be what you need to heal, smaller, more frequent meals so that your reflux can heal if, you have an, if you're working on reversing your hiatal hernia. Um, that can be helpful as well, making sure that you're not eating those huge meals. But all that, with all that said, everyone's going to be different. Some people with reflux can eat large meals and they're just fine. Others cannot. So you need to do what works for you. But don't let yourself get hungry. So no skipping meals, right? No intermittent fasting, not while you're healing your reflux, not while you're healing your hiatal hernia. And not when you're trying a plant-based diet. Because if you're starving yourself for long periods of time, you're going to be so much more likely to pull into that drive-thru and say, screw it, I'm getting a, a Big Mac or whatever, or to show up at that family reunion and go, ah, oh, buffet, I'm going to load up with everything in sight, screw it. Um, so, so yeah, and that means you need to be prepared too for those situations for when you're at work, you need to have your food. If you're going to a, an event, um, you need to bring food with you. If you're traveling or whatever, you need to think ahead about these things. And we talked about that last month as well, having, a, having your plan. Um, when you're starting a plant-based diet. Okay, so don't let yourself get hungry. Number three, now, so this is um, kind of a sidetrack, but it's still really, really important. It was one of the things that really changed um, my mindset and my strength when it came to really solidly committing to not just being a plant-based eater, but to being a vegan. And that is uh, taking a look at the ethical side of veganism, which is to say 
that we're eliminating meat, dairy, and eggs, not just for health reasons, but we're eliminating it because we don't agree with the conventional factory farming practices that we have today. And so, like I said, for me personally, I didn't really spend a lot of time looking at that. It's like, it was to me, it's like, well, I'm already eating plant-based. Why do I need to watch those movies? And why do I need to, you know, subject myself to watching these painful, you know, these animals suffering and being tortured and all of that. So I was vegan for probably a year and a half before I even started watching those types of things. And there's a lot out there and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, it's just, it just is what it is. Conventional factory farming is cruel, it's unnecessary, it's inhumane, and it's wrong. I mean, I don't think anybody could argue with that. There's a few people that would argue with that. Um, but conventional factory farming is, if you look into it, most people would look at that and go, wow, that's wrong. I don't want to participate in that. And when you go there, when you participate in really having a better understanding of what that is, it really motivates you to want to stick to a plant-based diet, right? Because not only um, am I feeling better, am I healing, the food's delicious, all that kind of good stuff, but I'm no longer participating in something that I don't want to support, right? And one of the things that I did was I went to a, a vegan festival, and every year at the vegan festival they have like this booth where you can put on virtual reality glasses, and it takes you into a factory farm. I've never been to a factory farm, but it takes you into a real factory farm. And the one that I went into was a pig farm. And it was really, really bad. It was really, really awful. It was really, really sad. I mean, I was crying the whole time. It was awful. And I have never <laughs> wanted bacon after that. Like, I just, no, I just don't. After seeing that, I just don't. And so, again, everybody's going to be different on this issue and where they stand. Stand, get that. But if you're a person that really, really wants to stick to a plant-based diet, maybe because you're noticing the healthy effects, maybe you're feeling better, maybe you're, you know, maybe you really want to get off of all those medications, whatever your goals are, but you really, really want to stick to a plant-based diet, this is one more facet that can really help you to um, to embrace the plant-based or vegan diet. Okay. So that's factory farms. Number four is really to educate and inspire and motivate yourself. And how, what's a really easy way to do that? Online. Online, you can learn all about plant-based nutrition. There are so many plant-based doctors that share content online, and I'm gonna talk about those here in a minute as well to give you some resources. There are so many websites, plant-based doctors, renowned plant-based doctors who who help their patients heal by promoting good nutrition first. In other words, when their patients come in, they don't say, oh, I'm going to write a prescription as a first, um, you know, line of therapy. They say, what are you eating? Let's talk about your diet. Let's make some simple changes to your diet. And they promote plant-based nutrition because we have a lot of science data and evidence that support that plant-based eating is very, very healthy. And it's a way to promote healing in the body if you're sick. So, um, so educate yourself, inspire and motivate. So when you're trying a new diet, if you have that element of you're feeding yourself some type of inspiration, right? Maybe you're watching somebody like you're watching me who he, they healed from a long list of diseases on a plant-based diet. That's going to inspire you to be excited about what you're doing and to want to keep doing what you're doing. Cause that's hard in the beginning, right? You're trying something new. Sometimes the food tastes really Blank. Sometimes you try a recipe and it's a real stinker. Sometimes you show up at a, you know, an event where there's all your favorite foods and poor me, I don't get to eat those favorite foods. So if you have that inspiration that's coming in, in on a regular basis, so that what does that mean? It means you're following, you find people that inspire you on YouTube and you follow them and you watch their content. Plant-based eaters, vegans, there's a lot of them. And you kind of have to take do a little bit of work to find somebody that inspires you. When I first started, I had a few people that really inspired me, and a couple of them I still follow to this day. Um, but that will really inspire you and motivate you to stick to what you're doing because it'll keep reminding you that what you're doing is, is good, that it's good. Because along the way, you're going to have those moments where maybe you fall off the wagon or maybe, you know, you... A close family friend tells you that they heard vegan diets were really unhealthy or, you know, your doctor says, 
gosh, you got to be careful on a vegan diet because, you know, this, this, and that. And it's like, oh, gosh, here I thought I was doing something good for me, and now everyone's telling me that it's dangerous. So, so you've got to educate yourself and have that inspiration flowing in on a regular basis, and that's going to really help set you up for success. And then number five, before I talk about some of the resources, did I turn that off? I did. Number five is accountability. So we talked about education, inspiration, and uh, motivation. Accountability is really important. And how do we have accountability? Well, you really have to you really have to grab somebody and take them alongside of you that's going to say, I'm going to hold you accountable and you're going to hold me accountable. You can find an accountability partner that wants to take this challenge with you. That's one way to do it. I have a business accountability partner in life. I have a workout accountability apart accountability partner in life. Why? Because when I'm left to my own devices, I'm lazy and I make excuses. <laughs> That's how I've been successful in life, in business, in my health. I have accountability. I have other people that hold me accountable. And so right now I have a workout buddy. We get together every single day and we work out and it's been wonderful. We started doing this about two and a half months ago because of the shutdown. I was so, so lazy. I was locked up in my apartment. Yeah, I could go for a walk, but I was, I'd rather stay home and see what's happening on Twitter. So. So I wasn't exercising, and um, so I asked a friend of mine, do you want to be buddies? And she said, yeah, I do, and we started working out together, and it's been great. So we hold each other accountable, and it's been wonderful. Um, but I wanted to mention health coaches. I am a health coach. I am not taking on clients at this time because I'm doing this, um, and so I'm taking a break from that. So don't reach out to me about being your health coach, but... Um, I can recommend um, one health coach in particular that I know personally that's wonderful. I'll talk about her in a minute. But you can do a search and you can find health coaches. There are thousands, tens of thousands of health coaches in the world, and they can coach you from anywhere in the world. I right? have thousand students. So, um, so there are a lot of health coaches out there. What do health coaches do? They hold you accountable, really. They come alongside you. Usually, like, what I did is I had a six-month program. That's what the Institute of Integrative Nutrition trains you for, a six-month program where someone hires you, and you meet with them on the phone twice a month for an hour, and you discuss goals, right? And you help that person really just unravel what their goals are and clearly define what their goals are and come up with ways to implement those goals, to reach those goals. And then you hold that person accountable because they have to – meet back up with you every two months and let you know how it went, right? That's how accountability works. It's like, okay, this is how it went. You know, I was supposed to do these two goals last week and this is how it went. This is, this is how I did. And so that accountability can really help you move to your goals. We can get stuck so easily in life where we just kind of can stay in the same place for a really, really long time, even though we have really, really good intentions. And so having that accountability partner just keeps you taking those steps forward towards your goal. And she also can help you, or he, can help you clearly define what your goals are, whether it's goals in your health and your fitness, goals in your social life, goals in your finances, your job, your career, your relationships, whatever that is. A health coach can help you clearly define your goals and start implementing, coming up with object objectives and tasks to start moving towards those goals and then hold you accountable. So I highly recommend health coaches or life coaches. Now, resources. So... Um, so the health coach that I will recommend to you, uh, her website is called Sage Brush Wellness on Facebook. Sage Brush, Sage Bush, Sage Bush. <laughs> um, her name is, uh, hang on just a second. Let me get to the right. Oops. Um, I think it's Sage Bush, Sage Bush Wellness. And she's Melissa's, her name is Melissa Homner, Melissa Homner, and she specializes in autoimmunity disease, right? I specialize in hiatal hernias, plant based nutrition. She specializes in autoimmune disease, and she's very, very good. She's very, very good and very, very um, experienced. Um, I met her at the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, and we've done a lot of work together over the years. And I highly recommend her if you want to work with a health coach who specifies in autoimmune disease. So autoimmune, that's things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, multiple sclerosis. Uh, that's her specialty. So that's who I recommend uh, if you're looking for a health coach. Otherwise, you can do a Google search and you can find a health coach. There's thousands, tens of thousands of us. 
Um, other resources I recommend, particularly for educating yourself, is um, on Netflix. There's a lot of documentaries. There's What the Health, What the Health. There's um, Cow uh, Spiracy, Cow Spiracy. There's The Game Changers, The Game Changers. And there's also a website called Forks Over Knives. And there's a video, there's a there's a documentary called Forks Over Knives too, but I don't think it's on Netflix anymore, but you can probably find it elsewhere. Forks Over Knives. So all of these um, documentaries, each one of them kind of specializes in a different aspect of plant-based eating. For example, um, uh, Forks Over Knives is much focused on the health benefits of plant-based eating, whereas, um, um, what the health and cowspiracy talk a little bit about the health, but they also talk about like the environmental impacts of plant-based eating and of course um, conventional fa factory farming as well. Um, and the Game Changers is one of the newer documentaries and it's really, really good as well. Really, really well done. Really, really compelling documentaries that you can watch. And then also Fork Server Knives has a website with tons of free content on it and so does um, the website nutritionfacts.org. That's nutritionfacts.org. Nutritionfacts.org is ran by Dr. John McDougall, and he gives out free content about the science as it relates to health and nutrition. So whenever new uh, studies are released about health and nutrition, he and his volunteer staff analyze those studies and do reports of them on their YouTube channel called nutritionfacts.org. So if you ever have a question about a particular disease or about a particular um, topic as it relates to plant-based nutrition, you can go to plant-based nutrition and, and type in the search bar, uh, whatever that is, and see if he's done, see if there's been a study on it and he's done a video on it. So he just reports on the science is what he does. So that's really interesting as well. And then one other website would be the Dr. John McDougall website. That's Dr. John McDougall. And Dr. John McDougall, he's an older doctor and he's been around for a long time. He has um, seen a lot of patients in his lifetime. He is a plant-based e eater and he's a plant-based promoter. Um, and he has a ton of free content to educate you, inspire you. In fact, on his channel and on the Forks Over Knives channel, there are a lot of testimonies. So if you need that inspiration about how people's lives were changed because they changed their diet to eating plant-based, go to um, Dr. John McDougall. On his website, there's a link that's called Star McDougallers. And that's where all his testimonies are. Okay, so that's it, guys. Let's go ahead, and I'm going to show you how I how I plate this up. Now, in my in my cookbook, I show you a plate. This is a serving dish. I don't know if you guys see this. This is like something you would serve, you know, at a potluck or at a dinner table. It's a big bowl. But I like to eat my meals out of a bowl like this because I can, especially a meal like this where you dump it in and you kind of stir it up because you can really get in there and stir it if you're putting a dressing on there. Um, so let's go ahead and do that and I'll show you what it looks like. So here I just have a cabbage, this is a Napa cabbage that I have shredded up. Cabbage is my favorite green. I'm gonna put a big handful of that in there and I'm also gonna add in just some salad greens. So we're gonna do a taco salad. So we're gonna do a handful of that. And I already put on a pot of rice. This is just, um, this is just white rice because it's all I had. So I'm going to put in a scoop of that. Boom. And we're going to do a generous, show you guys what this looks like. This is, so this is the taco salad. It's mushrooms and peppers and carrots and corn, cumin and sumac. Now I didn't add any salt to this because I'm going to top it with olives and avocado, which are naturally kind of salty. And I'm also going to put my uh, tahini dressing on there, which has, um, it has, um, what's it called, the, the Bragg's, um, or the, um, what's it called, the salty stuff, <laughs> the liquid aminos. Uh, so I didn't add any salt to this, but you certainly could if you wanted to. It's totally up to you. So here, can you see lots of goodies in there? So I have my chopped olives and my avocado. And... I keep these tortilla chips on hand for this dish because I like tortilla chips in my taco salad. So I just do like a handful like that and I put them in. 
I also keep these on hand for when my avocados, if I buy a lot of avocados and I need to use them up quickly, I make a guacamole and just have a meal of guacamole and chips. So the salad dressing the recipe that I have for this is the tahini uh, dressing, which is in the cookbook. And it's basically, what is it? It's tahini, cumin, what is it? I forget what all's in there. This, this one has lemon in it. It has garlic and onions in it because I no longer have reflux, so I put some of those other goodies in there. But I'm just going to go ahead and put a little bit of that on there. And I'm going to toss this. Kind of mush it up, crunch it up, and get that dressing kind of on everything and kind of mush up that avocado in there. And I don't know if you guys can see this if you're thinking, gosh, Pam, you're not going to eat all that, are you? <laughs> I am, and it's going to be amazing. I'm going to enjoy every bite. It's going to be really satisfying and filling so that later tonight I don't get cravings for cookies and things like that. You know, it's just really going to fill me up. And if for some reason when I'm done eating this, sometimes I'm just like, man, that was so good. I got to have a little bit more. So I might throw together. Of course, I threw that old whole avocado in there, didn't I? So if I want more, I'm not going to be able to put avocado on it, but that's okay. Um, so it's kind of ugly like this, but it's all just kind of looks like a, a goulash. But this is it. <laughs> that is it. And of course, a regular taco salad, you know, has those nice bright flecks of cheese and a nice, nice bright flecks of um, tomato to give it all the color but this is so delicious I won't miss those bright flecks of color it's gonna be amazing so I'll go ahead and take a bite make sure it's edible mm -mm -mm. Very, very good. <laughs> mm. All right, guys, I didn't see any questions today. So I'm going to take off. I'm in for the rest of the night. I'm looking forward to sitting down and relaxing. watching and I'll see you next week.